Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome to part two of Geologic Time. So in the previous video, of course, we've just been talking about uh, some of the attempts that have been made to try and calculate the age of the Earth, some of the observations that James Hutton made, and of course how he actually came to those conclusions, especially when it came to the process of uplift, erosion and deposition. So if you remember, one of the other observations that James Hutton made was uniformitarianism. So this essentially uh, was based on his observations. So whilst looking at the rocks on his property, he went and noticed that the structures and textures that he could see in those rocks were actually replicated in modern in modern sediments. So he could, you know, look at the sand, he could see certain structures like ripples in it. He could go to his local beach and he could look at the sands that made the beach there and he could see the same ripples. And so he realised that the processes that were occurring in the environment were affecting what he could see in the sediment. So essentially the sediment, sedimentary rock formed by the same process that was essentially forming the modern beach sand. And so this, was ter this is termed uniformitarianism. If it's happening now, it's happened in the past in the same way. So over the past 200 years or so, we've managed to collect a pretty serious amount of data, which has allowed us to produce numerous models and theories you know, for geology. One of the things that's become clear is that the rates and intensities of natural processes have actually varied through time. So uniformitarianism in its most pure in, in, in its most pure sense states that if it's happened now, it's happened in the past at the same rate. So things haven't changed at all. Every, you know, all processes will occur at the same rate throughout Earth history. Now we now know this isn't actually correct. Some processes like the rate at which new crust is made at a spreading ridge will actually change over time. Sometimes the spreading ridge will produce crust slowly, sometimes it will produce a lot of crust very, very quickly. So what this means is uniformitarianism isn't exactly spot on. And so uniformitarianism has actually been replaced by actualism. So actualism is essentially stating yes, if it's happened now, it's happened in the past, but the rate is variable. So, actualism is essentially, you know, also referred to by modern geologists as uniformitarianism. So, the pure uniformitarianism idea of Hutton has been tweaked ever so slightly. It's now called actualism, but geologists will still use the term uniformitarianism in place of actualism. Okay. So now let's start thinking about relative dating. So remember, we're, this is about putting a sequence of rocks into a chronological order, but there aren't any numerical ages associated with those rocks. So what are the techniques that we are going to use to actually come up with that relative date? So if you don't have access to you know, radiometric dating methods to give you that number, you have to relatively date your sequence of rocks. So the method will not produce a definitive date, all it will tell you is that rock A is younger than rock B and that rock B is older than... Uh, sorry, let's try again. <laughs> Screwed up there, didn't I? Uh, it will tell you that uh, rock A is younger than rock B and uh, that rock C is older than rocks A and B, for instance. You know, something along those lines. So what you end up doing is you end up producing a sequential order on your observations. You come up with a chronological history of that rock sequence based on what you observe. So this method allows geologists to interpret geological history and develop the relative time scale, which is, you know, to you and me, the geologic time scale. So there are seven principles used in relative dating. Superposition, original horizontality, lateral continuity, cross-cutting relationships, inclusions, baked contacts and zones, and fossil succession. Fossil succession is also sometimes called faunal succession. Now we're going to deal with seven in the next lecture, so we're only going to focus on uh, one to six right now. So the idea of relative dating can be traced back to Nicholas Sterno, and Sterno was a Neptunist. So what he was doing is he was making observations related to how rivers flood. So when he looked at the river and how, you know it's flooding and what happened afterwards, he noticed that the, the flood waters would deposit a layer of sediment over the area. Now, what he did is he then extrapolated this process and, you know, took it to a global scale and he put it into the context of the Great Flood. So he was using a biblical standpoint. Now, the observations he made, though, you know, if you if you just ignore the biblical context in which he put them, his observations are actually um, 
are actually accurate and his interpretation of them is also accurate so his work is you know is defendable with the exception of the context into which he placed the data he collected so what he noticed is that every time a river floods it deposits a layer of sediment the next time the, the flood occurs a new layer of sediment will be deposited over the top then the next flood another layer next flood another layer and so what he realized was that every time a, every time a river floods it will superimpose a new layer of sediment over the layer of sediment deposited by the previous flood and he, he also realized that once lithified these layers of sediment would become rock so this means that if you look at a sequence of, of rocks it would mean the youngest sediments would be at the top of that sequence and the oldest sediments would be at the bottom and that's the principle of superposition if you have a sequence of rocks the oldest rock will be at the bottom and the youngest rock will be at the top and that works for about 90 95 percent of cases there are instances when your sequence of rocks can be overturned in which case the oldest rock would be at the top and the youngest rock would be at the bottom but that's a relatively uncommon occurrence so he also noticed that uh, sedimentary particles settle out from flood waters under gravity and so this will produce nice horizontal layers of sediment and so this is the principle of original horizontality so original horizontality states that because the sediment is deposited as a horizontal layer when that layer of sediment gets lithified it will also produce a horizontal layer of rock because remember if you have a layer of sediment and you try and tilt it well that layer of sediment is going to slide isn't it it won't stay as a nice horizontal layer so that means in order to have a nice horizontal layer of rock your sediment needs to have been deposited as a horizontal sheet then turned into a rock so lithified and then if it's been tilted any tilting has to occur after the lithification so if we look at this picture here we can see straight away we have a beautiful uh, example of an angular unconformity there's our unconformity running along here we can see the rocks below the unconformity are dipping and the rocks above the unconformity are horizontal but this also tells us that these rocks here must have been deposited as horizontal layers of sediment lithified as horizontal sheets and then deformed that therefore means that these layers of rock here must be older than these layers of rock up here because these layers of rock are nice and horizontal and they haven't been deformed okay so this allows us also to you know to begin to gauge which layers of rock are older relative to other layers of rock the final observation that uh, the Stello made was to do with the uh, continuation of the layers of sediment which are deposited so when he tracked the layers of sediment deposited by floods as you as you move laterally you'll steadily see that your layer of sediment will get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and then eventually disappear it will in geology it will do what we call pinch out so that's option number one the further you get from the source of the sediment the thinner the layer of sediment will become and then eventually it will pinch out and disappear the other possibility is that your flood in layer of sediment deposited by your flood you'll be able to track the layer track the layer track the layer and then you'll come up against some kind of vertical surface like a, let's say a cliff face well obviously your layer of sediment will have to terminate against that cliff face so essentially this is the principle of lateral continuity and the principle of lateral continuity states that a layer of sediment will continue in all directions until it either thins and pinches out or terminates against the basin margin which is some kind of vertical surface so if we look at this picture here this is a seismic section okay so you know this is a, a, an image produced by geophysicists and it's showing you the layers of rock in the subsurface so what we can see here is we have a stack of sedimentary rocks in this basin here okay so there's the basin there so if you follow these layers of sediment you'll see when they get to the basin margin done they terminate right there so that's the old layer of sediment terminating up against a vertical face which would be your basin margin in the instance in this diagram your layer of sediment is continuing it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner the further it gets from the sediment source and eventually it pinches out and disappears so what Steno is essentially saying is that no layer of sediment will continue forever it will eventually thin out and be lost and be replaced by a different layer of sediment So following Steno's work, we now have the, an observation by James Hutton. 
So as we dis- as I discussed, he was he noticed that rocks like granite represented uh, magma, which had intruded a pre-existing sequence of rocks. And so this led Hutton to come to the principle of cross-cutting relationships. So he realized pretty quickly that any igneous body, like this dike here, or any fault that cuts a pre-existing sequence of rocks must therefore be younger than the rocks which are cut. So in order for this dike to have intruded this sequence of rocks, well clearly these rocks must have been there beforehand, and then the dike must have been intruded. Same with this fault here. These rocks must have been there beforehand, and then they were cut by this fault. Doesn't make it doesn't make sense any other way. So uh, the principle of cross-cutting relationships simply, simply states that dikes and faults must be younger than the rocks which they cut. So next we have the principle of inclusions. So the principle of inclusions is extremely straightforward. It's very useful, particularly when you're trying to determine the relationship between igneous bodies and the host rock, especially if that host rock is a sediment of some kind. So the principle simply states that if you have clasts, so fragments, of rock A contained in rock B, then rock A must be older. So if we look at these two examples here, we can see two different situations. So in example A, we have a granite down here in pink, we've got a sandstone in yellow, a, uh, a mudstone in brown, and the limestone in this kind of creamy grey colour. So what we can see here is that the sandstone, the yellow layer, contains pieces of the granite, the pink layer. So we can see the class, the fragments of granite there, contained within the sandstone. Well, in order for those pieces of granite to be in the sandstone, clearly the granite must have been there first, it must have been weathered to create the fragments, and then they became incorporated into the sandstone. Therefore, the granite is older than the sandstone. Now we have a different situation. In this instance, we have a granite which contains pieces of the sandstone. Well, in this instance, what's happened is, is the granite intruded the sandstone as magma, and pieces of the sandstone fell into the magma, they didn't melt, they just floated around in the magma, and then eventually when the granite, granite solidified, you ended up with these pieces of sandstone sitting within the granite. So in this instance, we have sandstone in the granite, therefore the sandstone is the older rock, and the granite is the younger rock. So that's the principle of inclusion. It's a very straightforward principle. So when you are looking at the diagrams as part of uh, the, assi- uh, the assignment associated with this particular lecture, Always take some time and just take a second and have a look at any class that might be in the block diagrams that you're given, because that's going to give you a good hint about which layer of rock came first. The final one we're going to look at is the principle of baked contacts or baked zones. So this one is related to the heat put out by some kind of magma intruding a sequence of rocks. So obviously when your magma intrudes a sequence of rocks, be it as an intrusion or a dike or a sill, well, that body of magma is going to heat up the surrounding rock and it's going to end up contact metamorphosing that rock. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the effect of the contact metamorphism associated with the intrusion is called a essentially will produce a zone called a baked contact so if I just skip to the next slide here we have a sequence of limestones and you can see we have a sill coming through straight here okay well if we look if you look to the top and the bottom of the sill you'll notice that the rocks here are a lighter color than the rocks up here that's because the heat from the magma which you know formed the sill essentially has cooked the rock above and the rock below. So it's contact metamorphosed it. This zone of contact metamorphism associated or caused by the heat is also referred to as a baked zone. And it quite clearly tells us that this limestone must have been here first because as the magma was intruded to form the sill, it cooked the rock below it and it cooked the rock above it. Therefore, we know the rocks below and above must have been there before the sill was in place. Okay. So, actually, do you know what? I'm just going to skip back to the, pre- to the next slide. Now, over here, we have a, um, a lava flow. So, here's our lava flow in the grey. And here's the sandstone that the lava flow moved over, which is this uh, kind of uh, yellow-grey coloured rock. Now, you'll notice at the bottom of the lava flow, it looks really, really rubbly. 
and that's because it contains pieces of the sandstone. So straight away, if we go back to our principle of inclusions, we have our lava flow containing pieces of our sandstone, therefore that means the sandstone must have been there beforehand. You'll also notice that the heat from the lava flow here has actually gone and baked the top of the sandstone layer and turned it red. Once again, this is, a very, this is another indicator that the sandstone layer was present before the lava flow was deposited over the top. Okay, so both of those pieces of information, the inclusions and the baking, tell us the sandstone was there first, then the lava flow went over the top of it. Now the thing is, is that if you were to look at the top of this lava flow, any rock above it would not be baked because there was no rock above the lava flow when it was extruded onto the surface of the earth. So if we look at our you know, it's a very simple diagram here, this is our lava flow coming over the surface of the earth. It's going to bake the rock below it, but because there's no rock above it, that means there's going to be no baked zone. So if later on sediment gets deposited over the top, the sediment on top of this lava flow will not show a baked zone. And that's an indicator that what we're looking at is a lava flow rather than a sill. So let's look at the situation here. Here's our sequence of rocks. Okay. So when we have a sequence of rocks like this and we have a, a horizontal igneous uh, sheet in it, like a sill or what, which could be a sill or a lava flow, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, is well, you know, what is it? Is it a sill or is it a lava flow? So let's think of the lava flow situation. So in the lava flow situation, what we're going to see is, you know, layer of rock number one would have been deposited, then layer of rock number two, and then the lava flow came over the top. Now, obviously, the heat from the lava flow would cook the top of layer of rock number two. Pieces of rock number two would also become incorporated into the lava flow. Then the lava flow solidifies, and then layer of rock number four is deposited over the top. Well, layer of rock number four wasn't present when the lava flow was extruded, and so it wasn't heated by the lava flow. So layer of rock number four will not have a baked contact. Layer of rock number four will also probably include pieces of you know, the lava flow, let's say maybe a basalt or something. And so we'll see pieces of our, our lava flow within layer of rock number four. So this clearly tells us that layer of rock, layer of rock number one was deposited, then two, then three, then four, five, and six. So that would be an example of a lava flow. Now, what happens if we have a sill being in place instead? Well, as you can see, what we end up with looks very similar, doesn't it? We've got one, two, there's layer three, four, five, six. In this case, they've even thrown up an additional layer, which they called seven. So how do, we, how do we know that this is a sill? Well, remember, a sill is a horizontal sheet of magma injected between layers of rock. So here we go. So we have layer one, layer two. Now notice layer two has a baked contact. So clearly layer two must have been present before the sill was in place. And then we have layer four. Layer four also shows a baked contact. So layer four must also have been present before the sill was in place. We, if we look carefully, we will also find pieces of rocks two and four within the sill. So both the principle of inclusions and the bait contacts will tell us that the sill must have been in place after layers two and four had been deposited. So layers two and four form and then the sill gets injected between them. So this is how we tell the difference between a sill and a lava flow when we see a sequence of rocks like this. We use the baked contacts and we use the inclusions. So these six principles of relative dating proved invaluable to a gentleman called William Strata Smith as he produced the first large-scale geologic map in 1815. I should point out, by the way, that he didn't produce the first geologic map. That was actually produced by a gentleman called William McClure. But I'm going to be honest, as geologic maps go, it's a little bit amateurish. So if we just skip to uh, McClure's map, you'll notice that this is uh, well, pretty much the entire eastern third of the United States. And in the entire eastern third of the United States, he has classified five different rocks. So, you know, that's not exactly a, uh, a, a truly spectacular geologic map, shall we say. It's a little bit too simplistic. Now, 
William uh, Strutt Smith, on the other hand, produced a very complex geologic map of the United Kingdom. Here it is. So you can see, number one, a lot more detail. But the great thing is, is because uh, Strata Smith used uh, the principles of relative dating whilst producing this map, it also meant that he could put the rocks on the map within a sequence. He could put them in a chronological sequence going from oldest rocks at the bottom to youngest rocks at the top. And so this meant that, you know, if you had a copy of his map and you had uh, the stratigraphic column he's produced here, you can actually work out, you know, whether you're getting younger in this direction or in that direction, for instance. He also managed to use the principles of relative dating to put the rocks into a sequence that allowed him to produce a diagram that also showed the relative relationships between them. So essentially he's got the Vale of the Thames down here, which is this area down here in, in uh, southeast England. And essentially his line of section is taking you across this entire sequence and up in this direction towards the northwest. So what you're seeing is essentially is a slice. So imagine if you took a giant knife and cut through the United Kingdom along that line and pulled the United Kingdom in two. This is a this is a simplified diagram of what the rocks would look like. And once again, he could only produce that using the principle of relative dating. Okay. So now let's have a think about numerical dating. So this is the process of taking a rock, or more accurately, a mineral in a rock, and using radioactivity to produce a numerical value, an age that actually has a number associated with it. So the majority of the 92 naturally occurring elements in the periodic table are stable. However, a rare few of them are radioactive. And of course, we've probably heard of them, you know, uranium, thorium, radon, uh, you know, these are all examples of radioactive elements. So there's also this, there's also a case that some elements which are normally stable, like potassium, will also have radioactive variants. So these are isotopes. So something like uh, you know, potassium-40, for instance, is radioactive. So if we let's just you know nail down a few terms to begin with. So an element is defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. So 11 protons means your atom would be sodium. 79 protons would be gold. 92 protons would be uranium. That number never changes. The number of protons tells you what element it is. This is referred to as the proton number, and it's often given the notation Z. We also have the atomic mass. So the atomic mass is the combined number of protons and neutrons, which is abbreviated to N. So the atomic mass is always going to be larger than the proton number, with the exception of hydrogen. So an isotope is when elements can have variations in the number of neutrons in their nucleus, but the number of protons is the same. So for instance, we have potassium, potassium 39, potassium 40, uh, sorry, potassium 41 and potassium 40. Okay. Now 39 and 41, they're stable. Potassium-40, on the other hand, is radioactive. So we know as they're all potassium, they have to have the same number of protons. The thing that's varying to produce these different atomic masses is therefore the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons will change producing these different isotopes. So remember, we know they have to be the same element because the number of protons in each is the same. However, the atomic mass varies because the number of protons are different, and so, sorry, the number of neutrons are different. And so this gives us these different weights, and each of these different weights is classified as an isotope. So uh, elements can have more than one stable isotope or more than one unstable isotope. So if we look at potassium again, we can see we've got potassium 39, potassium 40, and potassium 41. So potassium 39 and 41 make up the vast majority of all of the potassium out there, and less than 1% of potassium is the radioactive potassium 40. So typically when we write, um, when we write out elements, we obviously use the element symbol, so for potassium it's going to be K, and then we provide two numbers after it. The larger number is going to be the atomic mass, and that's located at the top. So remember, that's the number of protons plus neutrons. The lower number is going to be the proton number, so that's the number of protons by themselves. So we know in, in the case of potassium 40, we have a total of 40 protons plus neutrons, we know that 19 of them have to be protons 
and so that means 21 would be neutrons. Okay, so we can work out pretty quickly, you know, what the number of protons and neutrons are just by using our notation. So radioactive elements decay by emitting particles from the nucleus. They do this in an attempt to produce a stable nucleus configuration. So a radioactive isotope, by its very nature, is unstable. And the entire point of the radioactive decay is to try and take your unstable isotope and change it into a stable isotope, which will not decay. So uh, it can do this by decaying in one of three ways. Now, now these are referred to as particle decays because the decay will produce a particle which will be thrown out of the nucleus during the decay and that particle has mass. Okay, So as part of the radioactive decay process it's producing a particle which it's getting rid of and that particle is taking mass with it. So our three types of particle based radioactive decay are alpha decay, beta decay and electron capture. And these different types of decay are going to change the proton numbers and the atomic masses depending on what's happening. So in the case of alpha decay, your radioactive isotope is throwing out a particle that consists of two protons and two neutrons. So the particle it's getting rid of will take two protons from the nucleus and, and those two protons will go with it. So that means that the proton number of your element is going to decrease by two. Okay, so that's going to change what element it is. The atomic mass of your isotope is going to decrease by four, because remember your, your nucleus just lost two protons and two neutrons. So alpha decay is going to decrease the proton number by two and the atomic mass by four. So next we have beta decay. So in the case of beta decay, a neutron in the nucleus will spontaneously change into a proton. In the process, your proton, or your neutron should I say, as it splits into, as it changes into the proton, it will have to kick out an electron as a byproduct of that change. So this means that during beta decay, your proton number will increase by one because you've taken a neutron and you've changed it into a proton. The atomic mass, on the other hand, will not change. It will stay equal because, you know, to all intents and purposes, a neutron weighs the same as a proton and the electron that's, got, that's being kicked out has negligible mass, so it hasn't really changed the weight of your isotope at all. So beta decay will result in an increase in proton number and no change in the atomic mass. The final type of radioactive decay is electron capture. In electron capture, we have a proton and it gets hit by an electron. So we have positive plus negative equals neutral. So we form a neutron. So as part of this process of taking a proton and turning it into a neutron, we end up kicking out this, which is a positron, which is the essentially the, the exact opposite of an electron. Once again, though, the positron has mass. And so the positron getting kicked out is also a type of particle decay. So electron capture will cause the proton number to decrease by one because we've taken a proton and we've turned it into a neutron. However, as with beta decay, because all we've done is turn a proton into a neutron and they weigh pretty much the same, the atomic mass doesn't change. Now, there's another type of radioactive decay, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is gamma decay. So gamma decay is the result of excess energy left over from particle decays. So a gamma decay does not produce a particle with mass. Instead, it produces an electromagnetic wave. So it's not considered to be a particle decay because it, you know, because at no point does anything with mass get kicked out of the decaying isotope. So this process of taking an isotope and turning it into a new isotope is called radioactive decay. So the isotope that's doing the decaying is referred to as the parent isotope and it will decay over time to give us a stable daughter isotope. And so this diagram is summarizing what we're just talking about. In the case of alpha decay, the nucleus that's decaying will kick out a particle that consists of two protons and two neutrons. So that's an atomic mass of four. 
and so that will cause our nucleus to decrease by pr the proton number of our nucleus to decrease by two and the atomic mass to decrease by four. In the case of uh, beta decay, we have a neutron turning into a proton, and that's going to kick out an electron as a byproduct. And so that means we've lost a neutron, but we've turned it into a proton. So remember, they weigh pretty much the same, so there's no change in mass. However, the proton number has obviously increased by one. And then we have electron capture. So in the case of electron capture, we have a negative electron hit a positive proton. The two of them cancel each other out to produce a neutron. And so in this case, the proton numbers decreased by one. But just like beta decay, the atomic mass hasn't changed because we've just changed a proton to a neutron and they weigh pretty much the same. OK, this is a great place to stop. So once again, stop the video, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water and come back for part three.